I have the honor now to introduce somebody um, that is very special to our program, somebody um, who is very passionate about uh, community conservation. Um, that is now the real John Kasauna. Um, we talked about you, John, yesterday in your absence. I referred in my speech to John's father, who was a key figure in terms of being one of our first community game guards. So this is his son. We call him John KK. And John was born in the far north of this country also, which is on the northwest. The minister comes from the other side of the north. He comes from the northwest of the country. And John works for an organization which is uh, one of our network organizations called the IRDNC, which is one of the longest uh, acronyms, um, uh, the Rural Development and Nature Conservation um, Institution, which is also based here in Namibia. Now, John is one of 12 children. I don't know number what he is, but they were quite a lot of people, quite a lot of children. <laughs> And he's a Himba Herero. This is one of our indigenous tribes. I think when I did my presentation yesterday, you must have seen some of our indigenous tribes called the Himba. So John is a real Himba. And he started at school very late. Um, that was in those years very common because they are pastoralists. They move around a lot. Um, so John was enrolled very, very late in school. Um, he comes from as a pastoral, they are cattle herders, and I'm sure John was also, as a son, um, a cattle herder. Ne, John? Yes. Um, I also referred yesterday that apart from the poaching and the system that we used to have in place, uh, which was not very desirable, the apartheid system, Namibia was hit in the late 80s by a very, very bad drought. And that also saw the decimation of not just white life, but people were also very much suffering from that drought. And so John and his family also lost a lot of cattle around that time in the late um, um, 80s. Now, John went further. Um, as a Himba, around that time, it is extremely difficult um, to get to school because, as I said, he is a cattle herder and he had to look after cattle but his family and some of the support that he had around him, he managed to get into school, he managed to finish school, and then he managed to go to um, the Polytechnic of Namibia, which is the NAST University, um, which is it's called the NAST University today. And John managed to work his way up, um, working first as a field officer for IRDNC, and then from there on, he became, um, one of the uh, co-directors um, of this institution. And then uh, John then started to become um, what they called in the world of, of today. He, he became the person that is being sought after, not just internationally, but also very nationally in the country. Um, John got known internationally when he did his TED talk in the US. And the first thing John told me when he came back, he said, you know, Maxi, you go around and you talk to people, but I've met the most important person. I was talking to the most important person, and I said, who? And he said, Bill Gates. You know, I was talking to Bill Gates. <laughs> so, as I said, John has also won several awards. He spoke internationally, so he's somebody um, that really understand this program because he's been part of it as a community person, as an activist, but also as a practitioner. And the other one also, John, I always call him John the politician because he's also a politician in his own right. So with, without further ado, let me call John the real one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also tall, huh? <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maxi. Let me 
first and foremost acknowledge the presence of our Honorable Minister, um, Minister of Environment and Tourism, Pamba Chifeta, the host, uh, Chita Conservation Fund, um, Mama Rory, um, invited guest, uh, Tatisem, the headman. I think you said you're the chief, but the minister said you're a headman. <laughs> Demoted. Um, my colleagues from CBNRM, um, I see a lot of people from the United States here. I like it. Um, people from other African countries, SATEC, uh, and from anywhere else. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to, I don't want to repeat what the minister and Maxi have said. I think it's very difficult to speak after Maxi for one, and also to speak after the minister. So I just wanted to check what, talking about CPNRM Conservancy, is it really working? Does it really mean anything to a local person on the ground? That is what I want to sort of share with you. But before that, I just want to look at a step back as to what was going on before Conservancy. But getting to where we are today, it wasn't very easy. It wasn't very easy because it was at the time when the local communities were not regarded as responsible enough and they were not trusted with wildlife that we are talking about today. The Erie conservation approaches at the time was ready to remind our people, the local citizens of this country, people that left with wildlife, that they are the key in conservation. If we want to see conservation in a different way, they should come on board. Um, I think it also must be understood that in most cases, when you hear about coachings, people tend to point finger at the communities. But I can tell you now before independence. Before independence, everybody was coaching. I'm not trying to bring everybody into the matter that we were doing, but the ministry, the, the military, the army, you know that our country was at war for total um, independence. The military was putting high-ranking officials at the time. They were just going out and help themselves to what love. And of course, communities, we don't call it poaching, we were calling it um, sustainable utilization because there were procedures on how this should be um, conducted. Um, if you look at SATEC at the time, uh, poaching for rhino horns and elephant tusk was getting really out of hand. And Zimbabwe and Botswana, I hope our colleagues are not here. <laughs> they, they had a, an approach to, to kill. But even that, that didn't help. Um, but in Namibia, um, the people here use a very simple a very simple and a very easy approach, and that was to involve those that are living with wildlife, to bring them on board. Um, the effort was really to stop poaching, not to catch poachers. I know some of us, even from the northern part of the country, we were all poaching in Etosha, isn't it? Etosha, or somewhere near by where you see animals, we're just helping ourselves. But we were also trying to create a culture of respect and trust. That was very important. But one thing that I thought we also needed to know is that attitudes is a very important in, the, in all this. If we really want conservation to succeed, it should start with us. We have to change our attitudes. Um, as conservationists, sometimes we tend to think that we are doing the best, um, and others, like communities, are not bringing their parts. Sometimes we also tend to forget that the very people that we are saying they are not bringing their parts, 
um, before colonizations, they kept the whole area intact. Wildlife was free roaming. It's only after colonization that wildlife started disappearing. So for that, I think a recognition should be given to those that find themselves along uh, uh, name, uh, next to national parks or game reserve. I also wanted to point out that um, communities today in the whole of Africa, I don't know what is happening in other parts of the countries, those areas that we have formed now, are national parks, these were once, this were once the homelands. This were area where they were farming. And they were removed by force. Sometimes they moved voluntarily, but they were moved by force. So Namin PRCP and Arema approach was actually to restore that past injustice that was caused to the farmers in this area. Um, one of the other things is that if you really look in conservation, just take an example, Kruka National Park. Don't ask me why I'm asking South Africa. Um, there are people living next, around national parks, and these people are desperate. They are very hungry. They need something to put on their tables. But if the authorities are not working towards getting them on board, do you know what will happen to these people? They will keep on poaching. They will keep on helping themselves differently. That's why we are having this scenario of poaching. I don't, I'm not saying that in Namibia we don't have poaching. Yes, we have, but I can tell you where these poachers are coming from. They are not from Namibia. They are using us, but they are from somewhere else. So that's why in Namibia, we knew that. And the approach was really, you can go, you can have all the machinery, you can have all the technologies. You will have, you will have a, um, a losing battle if you are going to exclude the local people. All those people that are living with wildlife, um, they need to be brought on board for you to be successful. Having local people around your core conservation area, and who normally speak conservation languages, you can be rest assured that you have created a buffer zone. And I think that is the strategy that the Namibian government and the communities and NGOs are trying to do. Um, but one would ask, what would life have been without community involvement in conservations. Would we, would our Honorable Minister be speaking the same language as he was speaking now, Maxi and Rory? Would we have had cheetahs all over the place? Even though cheetahs, it's a problem, huh, to be honest, to some of the farmers. But if community were not involved in conservations, um, I can guarantee you now that there would have been no wildlife on communal lands. All wildlife would have been locked up in jail. I mean national parks. Um, desperate farmers around these national parks would have helped themselves through dubious means. Um, that is poaching or they would have moved the, in there illegally. And if there were no community involvement in conservations, in conservancies, I don't think that the, the jobs that Maxi was talking about would have been there. Because this is a rural empowerment initiative to create jobs, uh, to give responsibility, to convey ownership to those that are living and find themselves as wildlife. The JV partnerships that we have today is because of community engagements in conservations. For them to see the real meaning of conservations is when, if, if they are benefiting from conservation activities. 
through this, a lot of skills has been transferred. Some of the people like us, it was an opportunity for us to enter the, the, the market, the industry, and many other people from rural area, Himbas, they can at least say hi, hi, because they have lodges in the area. And all these empowerment programs that the ministry and our government is talking about in supporting NGOs would have been non-starter because there, were, there, was, there was nothing. All the, all the development would have been um, geared towards national parks. Our famous conservation conservancy programs would have been not existing if communities were not involved in conservation. I must say that tourism and conservation in Namibia is visible. Its impact can be seen. Through conservancy, local headsmen are granted conditional rights in return for taking care of wildlife. And they are benefiting from this. What is good about this is that ordinary farmers are empowered today to the extent that they can run conservancies themselves. They can run an entity equally equivalent to a private um, entity somewhere else in city. That is, that is the level how these conservancies are being run by these local communities. Yes, one may say that but there's a problem. They don't have the skills, they don't have the capacities. But if you really look at what they have done, the local communities, we can be proud. And we are proud as a country as well for having taken conservation from where we almost had 7,000 elephants to 23,000. That is through community interventions. And we have to thank ourselves and, and, and give ourselves a round of applause. The conservancy or CPNRM programs, for me, it really address the real livelihood issues. It's a bread and butter issues. And indirectly, to ensure that you have food on the table, you have to conserve. And I think this is how we, we all live in this world. We are all farmers, we are having cattle, we are having uh, chicken, we are having pork. We sell these animals to the markets, and this is how we sustain ourselves. And this is what our Namibian government have done to ensure that we create um, national parks outside national. I call it national park outside national park, honorable ministers. Because for an animal, I think they feel more free when they are outside the, outside the park than when they are in the park because they don't want to constantly bump against the fence. So these are the things that are happening without us realizing it's happening just because of the impact that it has on an ordinary farmers out there in the village. We have regions as remote as they are today, but there is life. Puros, for example, marine foods, um, and at the time, as I said earlier, it's because of conditions of policy environment created by our able leaders in governments to ensure that Everybody in this country have to, to play their parts in conserving wildlife. Government alone cannot do it. You cannot bring army here, they won't do it. You need informer. And the informers is the citizens. And the citizen is what is taking this country forward in terms of conservation. Um, however, with all this success, we, we, we have a big threat. And that is poaching, and I think our Honorable Minister did mention about it. Poachings 
by selfish individuals that are looking after their own pockets, uh, roping us from our assets, roping us from our uh, heritage. And I think as a citizens in conservancies, we, we are generously guarding against them. And I think we are working very hard with government and all law enforcement, law enforcement agency to bring the level of poaching almost to zero. There are evidence that we are actually um, breaking grounds. Another threat to the programs, as I said, is incentive-based programs. And for a rural person who lives in a rural hut, not a brick wall house, a house built from um, leaves or, or, or mopani woods, um, th there must be some incentive for them to continue doing what they are doing. Um, the other one threat that I said is that there is an ongoing campaign against the utilization of wildlife. Just imagine conservation that is progressing because people see the value for having wildlife around them, having a lion in the village, having an elephant in the village, having to send a school five kilometers away where you know that there are lions in between. The only thing that keeps these people moving is the incentives, and they also, most of the chiefs are also saying that wildlife culturally means many things to some of the African communities. In my Himba community, if you see an elephant, it's a sign of fortune. If you see a, this tiny little thing, ground squirrel, if it is cross the road, it only crossed the road after you were thinking about something. Then you will see it cropping, creeping across. Then you know your, 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 your imagination has been answered. <laughs> so what love? Culturally, it has sentimental some values to us. It's not just that we are conserving wildlife for the sake of benefiting through. Yes, we need to have them. They are like flowers. And I think one of the headmen said that in all the days when we had a lot of wildlife, people were not roaming around like they are doing today because they were afraid that they may may bump into an elephant or lions. So that in itself was regulating theft, uh, reducing theft, because most of the ugly activities are happening at night. So having wildlife around you is actually a bonus for these local rural communities. But for us to have a, a ongoing um, campaign against sustainable utilizations, I think we need the support of this house to open doors for us, for Namibia to strive even further with its policy of sustainable utilization. We call it conservation management, conservation hands. So, I think with these few words, I just wanted to inform the audience that we, we are really making its way. We are moving forward. We need the support of everybody from the Northern Hemisphere. And I think we, we are creating an assets that have got the interest of the international communities. Give us the necessary support for this work to strive, for conservation to become a leading, for Namibia to become a leading nation in terms of uh, CPNRM, Community Based Natural Resource Management. We are engineers of wildlife management. You guys, you can go to the space, you can go to the moon. We 
We know how to manage water. We know how to live with water. Thank you very much.